Thank you, Lone Ranger. Welcome to the George Thomas Clark podcast. Our guest today is a gentleman who has done what many of us would like to do. He has learned to speak Spanish fluently. His name is Gary Christensen, and we're going to tell you, and he's going to tell you all about his story. I'd like to welcome Gary. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. Beautiful uh, day. It's a, it's an awesome day here in Bakersfield, California. Uh, what's it going to be, about 85 today? I guess so, yeah. Yeah. Well, we're, we were uh, doing a little sound check uh, before the show, and we were talking about the weather and hoping that the President Trump is correct, that this sun will just evaporate mm -hmm. uh, the coronavirus. Do you, do you think that'll mm -hmm. happen? You think that'll happen? <laughs> well, uh, that's that. We hope that happens, you know. But uh, of course, I'm not a scientist, so. Well, neither. I yeah, really. neither am I. But uh, he, President Trump is a new. <laughs> ne neither is he, despite the uh, scientific brilliance of his MIT <laughs> professor uncle, which I think Donald feels that he was somehow imbued with the scientific uh, gravitas of, of his uncle. But okay. So back to Spanish. Um, I, a little bit about my own background. Um, I, I only had two years of high school Spanish <clears throat> ending in the late 60s, uh, my sophomore and junior year. And then I really didn't mm -hmm. speak Spanish at all uh, and couldn't say anything more than como estas, how are you, uh, until uh, about 20 years later when I started, 15 years later, I started volunteering in Sacramento and helping adults learn English as a second language. And I, I've found that I had some social opportunities as well as opportunities at school to just to speak the language. And uh, that was good, given my limited training. And then <clears throat> I came to uh, Bakersfield to teach it full time professionally. And uh, I got to know Gary and uh, who used to teach high school Spanish, and he was teaching English at the time. And I found that uh, students would compliment me. They'd say, y your, your Spanish is pretty good, but that guy over there speaks perfectly. And I'd say, well, I, I know he does. I know he does. Or if they, if they didn't know it was Mr. Christensen, they would say, they would identify you simply as that guy who speaks Spanish so well. How did you get to speak Spanish so well, Gary? Well, I uh, actually started studying uh, Spanish in high school uh, back in the 60s, and um, <clears throat> I don't know exactly how I got into that, but uh, I guess it was just an elective. I, I just studied for two years, junior and senior year. I think that was all that was offered at my high school. Um, and, of course, back then in Wisconsin, there weren't any Spanish-speaking people or, or very, very few you know, it's different now. Um, there's well, been a lot of immigration. Right. To, we, uh, places like Chicago, you know. Um, we, we have millions and millions of Spanish speakers, literally, here in California. And Chicago, as oh, you mentioned, sure. is, is now a, a great Latin hub mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, I can imagine mm -hmm. in 19, uh, let's see, you graduated from high school in 1962. 62. So right. in 1962, Wisconsin, there there probably weren't a lot of people lining up to take four years of Spanish. <laughs> were, were there many? Well, yes. um, <clears throat> go ahead. Well, go, go ahead. Uh, no, no, no. I, <clears throat> go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, um, <clears throat> yeah, I just have, I, I just started studying uh, Spanish, and uh, then my Spanish teacher uh, connected me with a. A student group from one of the uh, <clears throat> state colleges there that um, made a trip in the summer down to Mexico, and uh, I went with them, spent the summer there, I think about eight weeks in, uh, um, in Mexico, and then uh, I came back and where, I Gary, started... Gary, where, where in Mexico? Uh... We we're mainly in Jalapa, in the state of Veracruz. Okay. Beautiful place, up That's in the mountains. Uh, springtime weather all year round. I mean, I don't know. I haven't been back there since. But, uh, you know, Mexico has a number of places 
that have ideal weather patterns. Okay, so you know. at that point, there you are, roughly 18 years old. You've had two years mm-hmm. of high school Spanish, and all of a sudden you're immersed. Uh, what, well, were you down there studying Spanish, or were you teaching English, or what? What were you doing during those eight weeks? Just, just studying, just studying Spanish. Okay. Uh, and and uh, you know, in in one of the uh, uh, universities there, and um, you know, just kind of jumping ahead here. Um, I know that people are afraid of making mistakes, talking another language, and, and um, I, I remember one of my experiences that sticks out in my head. I don't remember all the details, but I, I was with a Spanish-speaking family there, and um, I wanted to say, I'm embarrassed, okay? So I said, estoy embarazado, because to me, embarazado sounded like embarrassed, right? It well, sounds like that, yes. Yeah, but it, it turns out what I said was, "I'm pregnant." <laughs> I know, I know. I, I have. <laughs> you know that. I love that word, embarazada. <laughs> I, I used to. So, uh, yeah, I, I used to kid. You know, at least I got the story right. About that. But uh, you know, I, 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 I've often said to people, you know, don't, don't be afraid of making mistakes. Uh, none of you have made the mistakes speaking. Uh, another language that I have, <laughs> you know, big, the big mistakes. So you just, now, obviously, uh, you know, I've learned that that isn't the way you say that, but, um, you know, I mean, what did I know after taking two years of high school Spanish and never talking to anybody outside of my classroom that spoke Spanish, you know? So, uh, anyway, <laughs> yeah. So I came back and I, I went to, uh, a small state university, for a couple of years, um, I started studying French uh, and Spanish at the same time. And um, then I went to, uh, I, I spent a year in France, in uh, Lyon, and uh, every French university has courses for foreign students. And uh, it was kind of unusual because I had only, I, well, I had studied French for a couple of years, but um, I kind of learned French in like, I don't know, maybe three months. And um, so it just kind of, you know, just kind of came uh, naturally in a sense. Well, it seems um, that uh, you have more linguistic talent than most because I, I had a, I didn't try very hard, but I had a, a semester of French in college, and I, mm-hmm. I just, uh, it, to me, the language was, it wasn't as difficult as say Chinese or something, but for yeah. me, it was far more difficult. I wanted to make sure to ask you. During those eight weeks, when you were pretty much a rookie going down there, except for a couple of years of uh, high school grammar, uh, how much conversational ability did you acquire during those eight weeks right out of high school? Uh, and, well, uh, some, some, you know, basic stuff. I, I was living with a, uh, <laughs> I was living with a, um, a, Sp- a Spanish-speaking family and, and two other American students. And, um, so, uh, you know, they, the, the family didn't speak English, so, you know, we had lunch there every day and, and so we, uh, you know, had some opportunities to, to chat with them, but, uh, you know, and, and then in course taking classes at the university, we had conversation classes, whatever. And so, uh, you know, we had some opportunities there to, uh, connect with, uh, Spanish-speaking people. What percentage of comprehension did you have, would you say, at the end of that two-month period? Oh, gosh, not not very much. I don't know. I, maybe 10 or 15 percent. Oh, well, I think you're not modest that in that regard. Well, what is intriguing was what you said a little later, and that is that you, you felt you picked up French in three months? Something like that. When you were in yeah. Leon. Now, how, we, we yeah. know that you studied high school Spanish two years. How much French did you study in high school? I didn't. Well, I started studying French when I went to the university. Okay, so, so had you, two had, years. you had essentially yeah. no back. Oh, okay, so you studied two years before you went to Leon. <clears throat> right. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and at, that, at that point I was motivated to... Uh, I, I had been. I was planning on teaching uh, world languages in school, so you know I, I, I did have a lot of uh, 
motivation to learn. But yeah, like you're saying, it 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 it, it kind of came easily too. Yeah, it, it, it did. I, I I'm uh, having t spent thirty years. Uh, 35 years, really, counting my volunteer career and professional career, helping people learn. Uh, three months is, is very fast, although sometimes there are students who uh, come in speaking very little, and then all of a sudden, boom, they're, you know, they're fluent. Um, now, uh, when you returned from Lyon, France, to the University of Wisconsin, we should point out Gary is a Wisconsin Badger, uh, Still very much a fan of the uh, football and basketball powerhouses there. Uh, you were uh, studying French with with a minor in Spanish, or how how was that structured? Well, as it turned out, um, yeah, I, I actually transferred schools uh, when I came back to the states and uh, went to University of Wisconsin in Madison, um, and. Yeah, I, I was majoring in French, but I, I was also studying Spanish, and and I had almost a um, I had almost a um, a major in in Spanish, but uh, it was a few courses short, actually. So, so when you graduated, what was your major? Uh, it, it was actually in in French. Okay, but again, I had I was I was short just a few courses of of Spanish too, so I was I was taking okay. both at the same time. Now I'll tell you, I'm I'm always very impressed with with students who who read English well. If I'm teaching that, or uh, if I know people like you who read Spanish very well, because reading in a foreign language is is quite difficult. I think it's even more difficult than uh, speaking. Uh, did you? Um, did you read books in French, for example, in college? Oh yes, uh, it, it, the the program was basically a literature based program. I mean, European literature. You know, um, that there was there wasn't that much. We did have one or two conversation courses, but basically they were uh, basically literature. Um, you know, the French existentialists and, you know, Camus and Sartre and people like that, Proust, you know. So you and could that. read their work and understand it in French? Mm hmm Well, mm -hmm. that's that's really yeah. good. And how many years, was that in your third or fourth year? Or I guess after a year in Lyon? Uh, yeah, that, so that would uh, be four years, four years after, after three years, uh-huh. Okay, but uh, again, I just uh, when I went to France, I, that that's basically what I did. Uh, now, I traveled a lot, but basically, I just studied. I just studied all day, you know. Now, as so. we were preparing for this interview uh, yesterday, uh, you mentioned that uh, a lady uh, was an eminent professor of uh, French literature at mm -hmm. the University of Wisconsin, and that she was a uh, perhaps a, a v quite good friend of the outstanding writer Albert Camus, uh, who won the Nobel Prize at age 43. Uh, tell us a little bit about that teacher. Well, uh, she, uh, again, I had her, I think, for two literature courses, and um, she was about 60 years old and, uh, you know, very... Uh, uh, very good instructor, and everybody, uh, you know, her classes were always full, and, uh, you know, I learned a lot about uh, uh, French literature from her, and, uh, you know, she didn't really teach grammar or stuff like that, but just, you know, just, I mean, she had, she had a, uh, she's, she's from Paris, you know, and so she grew up with, uh, with the language, and, um uh, uh, just had uh, a very good way of uh, of uh, sharing it with us. So I, I was very fortunate. I had uh, uh, a number of excellent uh, professors there to, uh, you know, help me uh, get my feet on the ground. Right. Now, evidently, uh, there were some who believed that she actually knew uh, Albert Camus personally. <laughs> well, that, that was kind of a rumor, <laughs> should we say. Yes. Well, <laughs> yeah. Her uh, name is Bray, B R E E, and uh, so uh, you know she taught for. What was her first uh, name? Because she uh, she can uh, be Germaine. Uh, 
Jermaine, uh, G-E-R-M-A-I-N-E. Yeah, Jermaine Bray. Yeah. Uh, we so should, very well uh, received. Uh, we very should well mention liked. to uh-huh. our listeners that uh, Albert Camus was a very handsome and dashing man, as well as an outstanding writer, mm-hmm. and was a mm-hmm. notorious or celebrated ladies' man, both in Algeria and later in France. So <laughs> I, I got a kick. I, I, the reason that it was timely for me, I just finished reading a, a, a biography of Camus, and, uh, oh, it was, uh-huh. and it was talking about his personal life, as well as his, mm-hmm. his professional life. Now, mm-hmm. uh, at what stage did you start studying the ministry? Well, uh, after I graduated from the university, I, uh, I worked with a student Christian organization uh, at Berkeley and uh, uh, Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. And uh, then I... Uh, I went to uh, two seminaries back in the Chicago area because that was, you know, basically where I'm from. And then I was uh, in the uh, with the Presbyterian Church for about uh, seven years, mostly here in uh, Bakerfield. That's how I got out to Bakerfield here. Um, and then uh, I, well, we had five children, and I wanted to spend more time with them. So I, uh, I went into teaching in uh, 1982, and um, I taught at Foothill High School for uh, uh, about 15 years, and then I started also teaching at the uh, adult school where, where you and I met, Tom. I remember yes, meeting you. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was... Uh, so in high school, basically, I was teaching English, to the Spanish speakers and Spanish to the English speakers. And then uh, when I moved over to the adult school, you know, I was basically teaching English and then citizenship preparation. I taught that for many years. Uh, Before we pick it up there, yeah. uh, I just, you mentioned Stanford. And uh, for our mm-hmm. sports fans out there, I want to mention that Gary uh, was at Stanford during the uh, two-year run, uh, 69 and 70, <laughs> when they uh, won the Pac-8 championship and went to the Rose Bowl and won both years. Jim Plunkett was the quarterback one year, Don Bunce That's the next right. year. Yeah. And I can remember uh-huh. Gary uh, years ago told me about hosting uh, w- at least one of the Thunder Chickens, which were the star of their defense, a guy named Pete Lazatich, uh, an outstanding player. He probably <laughs> played some in the uh, NFL as well. <laughs> And I think you said that uh-huh. Lazatich was worried about eating you out of house and home, so he had a dinner <laughs> before he came. And tell us about that. Oh, it's so funny because, uh, yeah, I mean, these guys were big. You know, they, at, back for then, they were like 220, 230 pounds. And, and Pete only ate as much as everybody else. And, you know, after we got that eating, I said, Pete, uh, what's up? You know, uh, you're not eating very much. And he drops his head, you know, and says kind of sheepishly, well, I ate in the dorm before I came over here. <laughs> well, I, I but also, uh, Jeff Seaman was uh, one of the students there that, that we knew very well, and, and Jeff went on to, uh, uh, I think, the All-American. He played middle linebacker for the Vikings for yeah. many years. Yes, he had a very successful career. I think he's still in Minnesota, I'm not, isn't he? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, he lives near Minneapolis. And uh, in fact, it was funny when we first moved to Bakersfield, we lived right across the street from Seaman Park. That was, that was named after his dad, who was a uh, eye, uh, eye doctor here. Oh, I see. OK. So, uh, anyway. Now, yeah. you, you uh, mentioned uh, <laughs> teaching high school Spanish for 15 years and made what is a little bit of an unusual move going from the regular high school into the adult program to teach English as a second language. What prompted you to do that? Well, um, I I enjoyed teaching at Foothill. Um, I really did. Uh, I had a a great staff of people to work with. The people at that time who were there had been there for 20, 30 years, you know, people like Ned Permenter, you know. The football coach, and, uh, 
Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it's the kind of school where you spend half of your time trying to motivate the students, you know, just because of the socioeconomic area. Well, that's one of the main reasons, you know. Uh, and I, as I say, I enjoyed working there, but at the adult school, you know, the, the people were there with a much higher level of motivation. And uh, remember, Tom, you know, if you don't teach them fast enough, they tell you. <laughs> you <know>? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. They complain in a nice way that, hey, you know, we're not getting enough. So I think, as I say, I started teaching in 1994. Uh, Blanca Cabasos was the uh, vice principal there at the adult school, one of the vice principals. And uh, uh, she asked if I would come over and, and teach uh, uh, in the evening there a couple nights a week. So so I did, and I really enjoyed it there. You know, I, I used to be, I remember dragging into the adult school at night, you know, after teaching high school students all day. But at the end of the night, I felt more energized, <laughs> you know, even after teaching for three hours there at the adult school, I felt more energized than when I got to school. So that was a good sign. <laughs> yeah, I, you know? I I always found myself uh, energized like like you. I uh, I taught uh, five mornings a week, a four hour class, just like you, and then I came back four nights a week for most of my career uh, for three hours. And that brings mm -hmm. us to our next point. Uh, I called Gary at times El Caballo, the horse, because of his phenomenal <laughs> stamina. I, I just mentioned my schedule, which was was quite challenging. Uh, Gary not only taught four in the mo four hours in the morning, five days a week. He taught the one to three shift, uh, which comprises a thirty hour shift, which is considered full time. And then he was coming back three to four nights a week uh, to teach a three hour class which he was the, the only person teaching that schedule. And in addition to that, he, I think you were shy about admitting it or you thought we'd be worried or perhaps even appalled, but you were teaching college classes either at Cal State Bakersfield or at the uh, University of Phoenix. Uh, do you have uh, more mental and physical stamina than most people? It, it certainly appears that you do. <laughs> well, I don't know. I've... Uh... <clears throat> Uh, I think some of that comes from my dad. You know, he was a real hard worker. And, um, <clears throat> I mean, so I, I don't know. It's just the old, uh, maybe the old Protestant work ethic, you know. But um, I, I've just always enjoyed learning, you know. And, I mean, <clears throat> uh, that that's kind of a gift that, that I think I have. I, I really enjoy learning. I, I enjoy learning things and talking about things with people. And so I think uh, that's how I, um, you know, and I, I, plus I'd always wanted to teach college, right? I mean, when I graduated from college, that, that, you know, that was one of my goals also was to, you know, someday. Uh, I'd wanted to get a Ph.D., but I, ne I never got a Ph.D. I have two master's degrees, but. Never got a PhD. So, uh, well, a bachelor's yeah, anyway. and two master's degrees, that's pretty good. Uh, I, uh, I was less disciplined than you uh, as a lad. I studied a lot independently, but I, I had to, in my late 30s, go in order to get this job, I had to uh, go at, back and get my bachelor's, and then I did some coursework for the adult education mm -hmm. credential. But I never got... Mm -hmm. uh, never uh, pursued a master's. It, it, it takes tremendous energy for one to work full time and then to go out and get a master's degree, taking classes uh, w when you have some spare time. But uh, considering the, the, the teaching load that you were going to hold, uh, that must have been, what, not all that difficult in terms of time? Well, it, uh, it, it took... It took a lot of time and, and energy, but um, you know, again, I, I, I've, uh, I've I've always enjoyed learning. Now, what yeah, are I your think, master's uh, degrees in? What what? Uh, well, one is in basically in theology, you know, and then mm -hmm. the other uh, from Cal State Bakersfield here in educational administration. So I see. 
Now, uh, yeah. one thing uh, that I learned once I started to have some opportunities to talk to students uh, during breaks, uh, getting invited to various parties, quinceañeras, 15th birthday coming out parties, mm -hmm. and, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. I found that uh, the Spanish language, which is one of the Romance languages, is quite correctly called a, a Romance language. It seems to me that it's <laughs> mellower, mellower than English. English perhaps has more of a Teutonic uh, or Germanic, mm -hmm. Germanic sound to it. And I think a mm -hmm. lot of times... Uh, let's say men from the United States, Anglo men from the United States who find themselves having social opportunities in Spanish like how relaxed and they, they undergo a, a slight personality change. I always felt that I was somewhat easier going in Spanish than I am English. And of course, oh. you're, you're, you're known as a mellow kickback guy anyway. So you must be <laughs> super mellow in Spanish. And we, and we, we should note here that uh, your wife is Spanish. And, and I think that uh, English is pretty much forbidden in the house, isn't it? Even though your wife's fluent in English, you guys speak Spanish all the time. Uh, we do, yeah. I mean, that's uh, if she wants to speak English, that, that's fine with me. But uh, she talks to me in Spanish 99% uh, of the time. <laughs> and do her uh, adult kids uh, talk to you in Spanish as well? One, one does and one doesn't. <laughs> okay. So I'm guessing the son so, doesn't. Anyway. Is that – who? which one does that's not? That's correct, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he yeah. – uh, I uh, I've learned that you know, of course, as I mentioned, I'm just high intermediate at the absolute most low advanced. Oh, you're doing and, fine. You're and doing very uh, well, Tom. well, but the thing is, when I say something to someone who's anything approaching bilingual, he or she will answer me in uh, English, and that's even a kid. If I say "Cómo estás," he'll say, "I'm fine." And uh, because people seek the best common language, and your yours is is good enough to uh, to do that, so you would say then that when you were not teaching English, most of your conversational activity was in Spanish. It sounds like, if right? It wasn't. Yes. Uh huh. But just you know, just kind of uh, building on what you mentioned there. Um, and again, this is stereotypic, but for me, yes, French is a language of the head, you know. Uh, the, the French that I learned and, and the people I connected to uh, from France were uh, kind of heady people, intellectualized people, you know, whereas Spanish to me is more of a language from the heart, from the emotions. And, you know, the, the, the Spanish people, st again, stereotypically, are, are very friendly, very open. The French people are, are, are more closed. You know, like when I was in France, it was very hard to make friends. But if a French person introduced you to his friend, the friend would treat, treat you like a friend, you know. But just to get to know people there was rather difficult. Now, maybe things have changed now. But, uh, you know, with uh, Spanish speakers, uh, you know, they're, they're more open, friendlier, uh, you know, more cordial. <laughs> anyway, that's been my experience. Yeah, I've, so, uh, uh, I don't have vast experience with, with French, but uh, certainly I've known literally thousands of, of Mexicans over the years, and, and they are very outgoing and warm uh, mm -hmm. gener generally. And uh, so uh, I mentioned your stamina and your schedule. I, I want to impress the listeners even more by saying that you maintained that until last spring when you retired at age 74. And again, this is true. Without exaggeration, I say this is a schedule that most young adults would not work because mentally and or physically it would be too tough. And so... Now you're teaching online. Do you enjoy having more time but less interaction with your students since you're teaching from home? Well, it's nice not to have to go to work every day. 
but uh, um, I don't know. I it, it's interesting. I'm I'm starting a course next week, a university course that is online active. You know, the ones I've taught before uh, were not active in the sense that you know the other person wasn't there on on the TV screen. Uh, this is this is a class that uh, the students are you know we're all there together from six to ten in the evening, and so that's been kind of stressful to be honest with you to to uh, you know make that adjustment. Like technological skills are okay, but you know I'm slowly learning how I'm going to teach this course. I know the content, but now it's you know teaching it live online is different than. Uh, uh, well, different than being in the classroom, in a sense, at this well, point. Well, anyway. what is the course? What are you uh, teaching? Actually, it's a religion course at the University of Phoenix. It's a, in their humanities department. Uh, we study uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, three major uh, monotheistic religions in the world, largest. Yeah, so, anyway. well, that uh, sounds it's like an interesting, an interesting class. And um, yeah. now, when the coronavirus epidemic uh, pandemic ends, uh, whenever that may be, uh, w will you teach in the classroom at the University of Phoenix on a part-time basis? Uh, I, I may do a little bit. I don't know. Uh, they're they're five-week courses, so it's not a huge commitment. Um, just kind of depends what I want to do with my family too, <laughs> you know, because uh, I had hoped to get to see them more. Uh, they live in different places. None of them live here in town. So I hope to get to see them more, my family, my kids, my grandkids. Well, that's right. So, you, uh, I yeah. know you, when I knew you, when I, during my career, I retired. I, I say quote unquote retired because I've been tutoring, all kinds of tutoring. Uh, in mm -hmm. homes and in libraries, uh, and of course writing mm -hmm. full time. But uh, you have uh, relatives, your wife's folks, and, and others uh, in Mexico City. You have uh, relatives in the Bay Area. Uh, you, you mentioned having five kids. Uh, Washington D.C. Uh, have, mm -hmm. have I, uh, Atlanta? Is that right? Is Atlanta, that... right? Uh huh. So. Yeah. Yeah, once this <laughs> virus passes, uh, you'll be uh, probably traveling quite a bit because you travel quite a bit when mm -hmm. I, even when you had uh, your your schedule at school. But at least teachers right. get off Christmas vacation two weeks, mm -hmm. spring mm -hmm. vacation mm -hmm. one week, and then yeah. even if you teach summer school, you have time off uh, f five weeks or so at the end of summer school. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, so yeah. you you'll have plenty of opportunities to uh, to travel, and uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, Gary, I was, I knew this was going to be a, a an excellent discussion, and I I'd like to thank you for joining us this beautiful well, thank you, Tom. Friday yeah. in uh, Bakersfield, and uh, let's uh, keep in touch and uh, absolutely and say hello to your uh, family for me. Thank you so much, Tom. I appreciate it. And uh, I enjoyed working with you all those years. <laughs> and we're still working together. Still, still work. Absolutely. All yeah. right, Gary. Take it easy.